As it's time to jump into the Word together, I'm going to ask you to do that physically with your hard copy Bible in 1 John. Would you turn there? 1 John chapter 1. We're very glad our sister Amy's back with us, battling a lot of sickness. God's been gracious to her, and she's going to share the gift of His Word with us now. She's going to read the entire first chapter. It would be projected for you if you don't have the NIV and it throws you off hearing and reading two different translations, understand that. So that's why that's there for you, if it's better for you to see what you're hearing. Uh, but as we come to this word together, let's go to the Father. And Father, we ask you in this time to do what is absolutely necessary to make this time meaningful and powerful for us. And that is, Lord, would you send your spirit afresh to bring the, the words to life so that they're not just words, but that they would be truth and reality, that they would strike us to the core, that we would be left asking, what shall we do? We pray, Lord, that as a new creation people, we would shape our new creation view of our world, that we would be like Jesus. May you do all this now, in this time in your word, and I ask it in Jesus' great name. Amen. Let's give our full attention to the word together. This morning's reading is from 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. As we jump into the Word today, the, one of the reasons I chose this passage, I love this passage anyway, but one of the reasons I decided to have this passage read as we jump into the message is you noticed a few times the word fellowship in there, I'm betting. And the fact that is expressed here so beautifully, I love what John is writing here, is that our fellowship is with God, with His Son Jesus, and without, with whom else? He says, with each other. Twice, he emphasizes that. So we're going to dive into today is what does that, that fellowship mean? What is the source of that fellowship? What does it look like to devote ourselves to fellowship the way that Luke said the first church did in Acts chapter 2? Let's review a little bit because we, are, we have been places and that's a part of where we're headed is where we've been. Uh, last time we looked at the first in Luke's list in Acts chapter 2, you remember he said the church devoted themselves to and then he gave us a short list. The first on the list is they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, which we're doing again today. That's what we do, right? The second thing he said they devoted themselves to was to fellowship. And then he said to the breaking of the bread and then to prayer. So you might know kind of an outline of where we're headed <laughs> in the next couple of times I share with you. So today I want to really focus. And we, want to get, we want to get practical and clear. What does all this mean? Because if the first church did it, it looked like something, right? Like Luke was reporting what was happening. Something was being done that he said that to describe it. They devoted themselves to fellowship. So what we want to do, oops, okay, a couple more review things. I asked a few questions along the way about this life that we read the first church had. And one of the questions about it was, do we want that kind of life? 
Are we actually wanting a life of that kind of shared community? Is that something we're interested in? And I'll tell you, that's not a rhetorical question. The reason we actually have to ask this question and honestly seek an answer is our culture is not built on that. We weren't raised in that kind of culture. We're raised in a very individualistic culture. Maybe your nuclear, nuclear family is that way, but most aren't. But, but to a wider community like this, we don't know what that's like. In fact, our, our culture teaches us to be a little suspicious of that kind of life because it kind of smacks of communism or communes, you know, those weird people out in the West Coast do that kind of thing, you know. Everything's shared and kumbaya, and we, we almost, it sounds weird to, to the culture most of us have been raised in. So that's a real question. Do I actually want that, or do I have like a suspicious vibe about that? When I re- read what Luke said about the first church, do I think to myself, that sounds nice for them. I'm glad we've got what we've got. Or is that, do you sense in your inner self, because of the Holy Spirit stirring in you, a longing for that because you know that's the kingdom of God. That's what God wants for his people. So that's the first question. And I can't answer it for anybody except my own self. Do I want it? And as we answer it collectively, one at a time, we'll know, do we want it? Last time I asked this question, and this is another question we have to keep asking all along the way. How are we doing with this? Whatever this is, today it's going to be fellowship. How are we doing with that? Again, honestly, what's the point of doing it if you're not going to be honest, right? We just want to know. How am I doing in this? What's my habit? What's my mindset? But then as we each answer it, individually, we'll have a collective answer. How are we doing? Because Jesus never tells you what he wants just so you know. Just so you know. Don't worry about it. I just wanted you to know. That's never Jesus' thing. Jesus always wants us to conform to his word. Will you agree with me that Jesus is Lord? He is Savior, and we love that part. Because if you believe you're on your way to hell and can't do anything about it, like, if someone can step in and change that story, we're all in. Like, thank you, Lord, for saving me. And like Psalm chapter 3, thank you for saving me from the enemies that face me here and now. Thank you for saving me. But do you realize the only reason he can save you is because he's actually in charge, right? If he's a weak little limp noodle, he can't save you from anything because he's got no power and authority. So just realize, as soon as you look to him as Savior, you are at the same exact moment, acknowledging something about his authority in this cosmos. And so if he has the authority to save you, you also are recognizing he has the authority to rule me. So if he tells me I want this, the only reasonable answer for a servant of the Lord Jesus is what? Yes, Lord. Or maybe, yes, Lord, could you explain that? (laughs) That is a very legitimate answer. I want to please you, Lord. I want to do what you're saying. I honestly don't know what you're talking about. Have you ever been there? Yes, Lord, please explain. And that's one reason why we do what we're doing right now. You might go home and read the, the statement, Jesus wants you to do this, and you're like, yes, Lord, what? And so we get to get together and talk. Now, at this particular moment, I'm the one talking. I've done my due diligence in studying it out. But remember, this is not the only time we do that. Hopefully, and we got to do a little bit just before the service, hopefully you get together with other disciples over coffee, over whatever. Maybe you're eating the the monkey bun at the Heritage Days thing, right? You get together. Food's usually a good thing to have in the mix. And you say, you know, I was reading. I was listening. Apostles' teachings. I was hearing what Jesus wants, and I really wanted to do it for him. No idea what he's talking about. Like, that's fair game, and we get to talk about it. Now, every person in the group might be saying, Me too. Yeah, what's up with that? And then you think, okay, how do we find out? That's that's what disciples do, right? Anyways, okay, how are we doing? So, let's jump in. What what John says here in 1 John chapter 1, and I love this, in verses 3 and 7. Verse 3, let me say this, read this again. We proclaim to you, now we means the apostles, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard. Remember, they are eyewitnesses. They actually were there present to see and to hear everything that they were talking about. We, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard. Why? So that you also may have fellowship with us. 
No. The apostles aren't the most important people in the universe, but they're pretty awesome, and they're pretty important. They are the foundation of the church. Right? In fact, in the book of Revelation, when John has a vision of the city of God coming down out of heaven to come to earth with us, oh my gosh, I want to talk about that now. But anywho, when he's describing the city, he's talking about the foundation, the multi-layered foundation of the city, what it's built on. And do you know whose names are in the foundation? The apostles. It goes with what Paul wrote. The, the apostles and the prophets are the foundation of the church. Think about this now. What did John just say to these poor, mostly uneducated, from the world standard nobodies? What did he say to them, the nobodies? We want you to have fellowship with us. We want you, whoever you are, if you follow Jesus, we want you to have everything in common with us who are the foundation of God's church. And I love this goes exactly with what Peter wrote. Same thing. He said the same thing to his people in a different way. And he said uh, he wanted to, to write about the, their faith, which is as precious as ours, Peter said. Your faith, as the, again, them, the uneducated, poor nobodies, your faith is as precious as our faith as apostles. <laughs> so that's one thing. Okay. But then notice what he keeps saying. And our fellowship as apostles is with the Father. Now, if you're paying attention and you're reading John's words, you stop right there. You can't even keep going yet because your brain is now trying to compute this statement. Like, if you know what fellowship is, fellowship is the sharing. Fellowship is having things in common. Now, focus on that word common with me. That's what fellowship focuses on, having things in common, right? Would you, would you usually associate God, Creator, Almighty, in Impotent, uh, um, I'm sorry, impotent. Wow, that was a terrible mistake. Omnipotent. Somebody call me on that one. Holy cow. Omnipotent, omnipresent. What else? What's the third one? Do you know the other omni? Omniscient. All of these sound very religious, so let me, let me say it a different way. Who knows all there is to know, who is everywhere there is to be, and who can do anything that can ever be done. This is our God. Do you ever associate him whose thoughts and whose ways are higher than our ways like the heavens are above the earth? This God who sits be between the cherubim, exalted on high in the heavens, before whom all the angels in heaven and earth bow down to worship. Do you ever associate this person with the word common? And do you ever think to yourself, I've got things in common with God? But listen to what John just said. We want you to have fellowship with us, so we're going to tell you what we know and what we've seen and heard, and our fellowship is with the Father. I like jaw drop moment, mind blown moment, but not just that, okay, that, that's huge, that's a mountain that we got to climb, but think about this, our fellowship is not just with the Father, it's with His Son, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Christ. And like, well, that one's a little easier. He was human. But what a human. Like, you're thinking of this man, Jesus, who's walked on water, raises dead people like it's no big deal, right? He's casting out demons with a word. He dies for the sins of mankind because his life is that huge and powerful. And you think to yourself, I have fellowship with him? So he starts with the apostles. That's, that's a big deal. He gets to God the Father you're like, no way. And then you get to Jesus like, I don't know. And if, here's the thing. If you aren't taking John at his word, that he knows what he's talking about, you will dismiss everything he just said as a fantasy. And even Christians can do this. Is it any wonder that Paul the Apostle says, we walk by faith, not by sight? Because every cool thing that, that the Lord Jesus came to reveal to us is so outrageous to the natural mind if you go only on what you're seeing and experiencing. You will dismiss it. You'll spiritualize it so it doesn't mean anything after all. It's just some beautiful poetic thing. But if you have trust, that's what faith means. If you trust that these people know what they're talking about because they have seen and heard it with their own eyes and ears, and you know they're right, you just know they're right. Even when you see something that seems contradictory to it, you're like, ah, but I know it's true. <laughs> My brain tells me it's ridiculous that I have any fellowship with God the Father. 
but I know it's true, right? Oh, anyways, I, we need to move on just to get more practical, but I just, I just wanted to share the, my, my mind blown with you. This is, this is what we have as a people. So if the word fellowship means having things in common, here's my question. I'm a, I'm a disciple just trying to wrap my head around these things along with you, and my question is, if it's true we have fellowship, and that means having things in common, to me, the natural question is, so what do we have in common? Especially with God and with the, the Son, Jesus. What do we have in common with Him? Because I'm little old me, and He's big old Him. What does He have in common with me? I'm going to start with the most obvious, and this is actually where my brain wants to just stop, because this is... This is the one that's the clearest from the very beginning of the Scriptures. What I share in common with God is His likeness and image. Isn't that true? When God created man out of dust, what was He going to do to bring him to life? Do you remember? What a cool picture this is. Oh, if you missed this detail, come on with me. Now, he's got this pile of dirt, looks like a guy. And it's just a pile of dirt that looks like a guy. And this is supposed to be a creature that's going to rule this planet. So what does he do to turn a pile of dirt that looks like a guy into this, this being that shares his likeness and image that will rule a planet for him? Dang. I want to see that portrayed in a movie accurately. Because that, wow, what does that mean? He breathed into him, not just over him, into his person. It's like, it's like a mouth-to-mouth resuscitation thing almost. Like, now, the breath of God, the spirit, by the way, interesting tidbit. In Hebrew, the word for spirit is the same word for breath and the same word for wind. God's spirit is his breath. He breathes his spirit into the man. Do you know that, that human beings share God's likeness and image because from the very get-go, there was a part of him in us bringing us to life. Man. So we share that in common with God. That's a mystery, though. It's hard to wrap our hands around what that even means, that we share His likeness and image. But there's obviously a wisdom to us that God has. There's obviously a creativity. There's this willpower that we have that God has. Unfortunately, all of those things are broken because of sin. Jesus is redeeming it like only He can. What else do you have in common with God the Father? And the answers to a few of these are going to be the same answers we have for what we have in common with each other. This is the biggest one, the single biggest one that we have to acknowledge and celebrate. What we share in common with God the Father is that we love His boy. We love Him. Now, how much did God the Father love Jesus, and how much does He love Him still? You think, now, I don't know, if a father sends his son to die horribly and suffer terribly, I don't know how much he must love him. When Jesus came out of the waters of baptism, before that terrible suffering and death, when Jesus came up out of the waters of the Jordan River, what does the father say? Do you remember? Come on, this is good. What did the father say? Whom I love. With him I am well pleased. I love this kid. When Jesus is on the mountain being transfigured, he has three of his inner circle disciples there, and they get to see something no one else gets to see. And, and he's, he's transformed before their eyes to be his true glory in their, in their sight. John was one of them, and he's the one who says, what I've seen in her, I'm going to pass it on to you. And he got to see it. He got to hear it. And as they're there, and they're, they don't know what to do, Peter's just, ah, blah, blah, blah. we should build something. And <laughs> he doesn't know what to say. And, and Jesus is brilliant and glorious. And then this cloud covers the top of the mountain. They're enveloped in this cloud. And they hear the voice of God himself. Do you remember what God said in that moment? This is my son whom I love. But he changed it this time. Instead of saying, with him I'm well pleased, he said, listen to him. Yes, sir. But you see, when, when we agree on who Jesus is, we agree on, on his glory, on his goodness, on his power and authority, what his role is in this world and in this universe, do you realize we now have something in common with God? 
If you love Jesus, you love who God loves. And if Jesus pleases you, like you are just tickled pink by Jesus. He delights you. Everything he does is just, yes, Jesus. If that's you, and you want to just standing ovation, everything Jesus, 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 you're like God. Because Jesus pleased the Father to no end. Everything about Jesus made God happy. Woohoo, my boy. And it wasn't just the sentimental, since it's my son, I like it. Jesus could have displeased Father, but he never did. He, everything he did was just what Father wanted. Everything he said was just what Father wanted. If you are absolutely madly in love and in an admiration with Jesus, I just want you to know something. You've got something really deep in common with Father God. And guess what? With every other person that deeply loves and admires Jesus too. Now, what I'm going to focus on in these next slides is what we have in common together because that's really uh, what Luke was focused on in, in Acts chapter 2. I just want to take those few minutes and just meditate on the wonder of fellowship with God because that's pretty awesome. Um, I wanted to first look at Ephesians 4, 4 to 6 with you. And I just did a breakdown on the screen. But do, do look at those verses when you have a chance. But this is Paul, and the book of Ephesians is very much about the church. And if you're not familiar with the book of Ephesians, you might be missing a lot of your vision of the church. But here's what he says when he talks about what we have together as a body. He says, number one, we are one body. Number two, we share one spirit. Number three, we share the same hope. We were called to the same hope. By the way, what is that hope? Like that doesn't mean anything if you don't know what it is. And if all you say is heaven, you're, you're getting there, but you're not there. What is the hope? What is the promise, the certainty of our future? Number one, Jesus will return. Amen? Number two, when he returns, he's going to remake everything, including our bodies. Number three, he will, when he remakes everything, Give us again charge over his planet that will be perfect forever. And he's going to live with us, with us there forever. Like, that's hope, y'all. It's not just after I die, I'll be comfortable. <laughs> I'll be in a better place. That's the beginning. That's the waiting place for the truest hope that's coming. That's what we have in common. We have one Lord, Master. I, I like saying Master just because it's got some teeth to it, you know? Lord is kind of medieval. It's kind of old England. Master, we, the master-slave thing, it's got teeth for us. And I say master, and it really tells me something about Jesus. He's my master. We have the same faith, the same baptism that we share in, and we have the same God and Father who's over all, through all, and in you all, Paul says. Just that list tells me we should be the most united people in the entire world. There shouldn't be any group of people who has a deeper intimacy and bond than the followers of Jesus Christ. But would you say you've ever encountered people with a stronger bond than you see in the average church? Yeah. And the reason is we're not really, we're not living out the reality that Paul tells us is real. This is what we share, everybody. This is common to all of those who follow after Jesus. And, and okay, I went through the rest of the New Testament. And I use my handy-dandy concordance, which you have access to yourselves. And, and you look up the word share. Just look up that word in the New Testament. And here's what else we share in. A few of these are like, oh, I don't want to share that. You can keep that. I don't want to share that, right? But, but all of this is what we share. You've got to share them all or you can't share any of them. He says we share in the sufferings of Christ. We share in sufferings and because they're Christ's. We share in Christ's glory, and so we share that glory together in the blessings, material and spiritual. Never leave out the material. We're supposed to share in material things together. The sorrows that come with living life and being a disciple, the comfort that comes from living life with God as a disciple of Jesus, we share in God's grace. We share in eternal inheritance you know, you, you've maybe heard of or been a part of a family that was great until an inheritance was thrown into the mix. I've heard about this my whole life growing up, and as an adult, I actually understand it a little bit. But inheritances that are meant to be a blessing can actually destroy a lot of things. Have you experienced that? 
or seen it? Not in God's family, okay? Because when it comes time to divvy out the eternal inheritance, which is the entire universe, everyone's going to be so grateful and humbly happy for each other. We all get to share it. And here's the thing. It all goes to Jesus and get, this is the culture of his family and kingdom. It all goes to Jesus, and so how do we get any? Jesus says, hey, Daddy, I want my brothers and sisters to have it too. I'm like, Jesus, take it. You're with me? Like, Jesus, you have it. <laughs> you did so much. You are the son that did everything what Father wants. You get the inheritance. Just throw me a scrap here and there, Jesus. I'll be fine. And he says, no, boy. No, Ryan. You're a full member of this family. You're a son of the God that, that I'm the son of. Now, you get to have this inheritance with me. This is the culture of his kingdom. We share that inheritance together. We share in a heavenly calling. And that's not just the call to go to heaven. It's the calling that comes from heaven to us. We share in the holiness of God. And we share this salvation from everything that endangers us. Temporarily and eternal. This is what we share in. And this is all just partial lists. So, I want to encourage you, as my brothers and sisters, this all sounds very biblically academic, and we don't have time to break them all down. So let me go probably to where we can sink our teeth in pretty easily. If I were to say, what are our differences? Could you come up with a list pretty quick? I've got one. It's a silly one, but I was thinking about it today as I looked in the mirror. Anybody else have trouble growing facial hair? We have fellowship. Like you're looking at this, you're like, that was probably his, his uh, five o'clock shadow. This is a week, everybody. This is a week. Come <laughs> And the only reason I do is because Christina wants it to happen. I'm like, I'm trying. Now, if you, if, you, you know, if you wake up the next day and you've got more facial hair than I do, sorry, we don't have no fellowship. I cannot. I was at the barber shop, Miller's Barber Shop, and they're selling this uh, homemade mustache uh, oil. I looked over there. Hey, you're selling this stuff. Yeah, do you make that yourself? Yeah. I can't help you, brother. Sorry. <laughs> I'm never going to get there. And he's talking about his, and he's like, down here. See, we have so many differences, even small, silly stuff like that. Where do you sit in the, in the sanctuary? Are you a back pew sitter, front pew sitter, left side, right side? Which kind of music do you prefer? Hymns, contemporary, instruments, no instruments? Can't, like, isn't it the most obvious thing in the world, what are you, what's different about us? And so, can I bring you back to what Paul said? We walk by... Faith, not by. Look, the reason that the, the world is not seeing the unified people of Christ that we're reading about in the Scriptures is because we, so much of the time, are walking by sight. And I look at you, and you know what I see? I see what's different about us. I hear you speak, and I hear what's different about you than me. It's politics. It's everything. Everything. It comes to our minds so quickly how you're different than I am. I'm not comfortable with you now in whatever way. And then there's those rare people that everything about them is so simpatico with us, it's so in sync with us, that now we click up. Have you ever known of clicks happening in churches? Why does that happen? Same reason it happens in the world. Because I feel comfortable with you. Because we have so much in common. We can talk about the same music. We can talk about the same restaurants we eat at. We can talk about whatever. And that's not the reality Paul was writing about. He was writing about what we all have in common. All of us have in common as disciples of Jesus. Now here's going to be our struggle. Here's going to be our call from the Master Jesus. And he's Master. He gets to get what he wants. And, and he's calling us to, to force our brains, force our spirits to when that thought comes up of how they're different than I am. That's why I can't be comfortable with them. We take charge. Remember, you have self-control as a fruit, a result of the Holy Spirit, right? Galatians chapter 5. That's a result of the Spirit abiding in your flesh that you can control yourself now in a way you never could before. You can. And you're going to train to get even more as you go, but 
as soon as the Spirit abides in you, you are now empowered to do what you couldn't before. You can control your own self. And your brain, which used to control you, and your flesh used to control you and all that, your brain that says they're different than I am, I can't be totally at home with this person, you speak because you now have control and you say, no. Yeah, I'm different from them in that way, but look at all the ways we're the same. Look at what we have in common. So you're driving in the car with a brother or sister, going wherever you're going. You can't agree on the same restaurant. You're fighting over what's on the radio and, you know, whatever it is. And and, and after all the arguments about all these silly, petty things are over, you say, well, you love Jesus, right? Yep, me too. So let's turn off the radio. Let's talk about him. Right? At the end of the day, all that we share is so hugely overshadowing all the reasons why uh, that person. Now, that's a pretty cynical view. I don't mean to say that every time you see someone who's different than you, you're like, ew. But isn't that what keeps us from the common life we see in the book of Acts? It's not that you're ew. It's just not, I'm not at home with you. There's a couple that I am, so, but not you all. And Jesus is saying, Jesus is saying this, not Ryan. I wouldn't say this because I don't like it any more than most people. But Jesus is saying it, and what he says is, enough already. You're my family. You're each other's family. You have everything that matters in common. So he says, stop and dive in to a shared life together. You know, this coming Wednesday, as I'm planning rather spontaneously to get together to worship the Lord, one thing I have to think about is uh, I wonder what kind of music, musical worship, people that come will want. Did you know that music is one of the greatest dividers in the church? Did you know that? Did you know that churches have split over the musical style that's chosen? And even if they don't part ways, they part meetings. There's one church, but let's meet two different times. So that in this one, the only difference is in this one we have older style music, and in this one we have newer style music. Do you, now I'm not, criticizing those leaders because it's a hard thing to have to work through. But do you realize what that choice tells you? What does that choice tell you? When we are going to split ourselves into two unrelated groups so I can have the music I want. What does that tell you? That one thing trumps all of this. All of this falls second to musical style. Isn't that what it says? Now if I'm being cynical, you tell me. But I'm trying to think through this, the way Jesus sees it. How would he sit? Now, what if we had uh, pews and in another room we had padded chairs? What if we split it into two services so some people could sit in pews and some people could sit in padded chairs? Would you think that was ridiculous? Me too. It's not that big a difference between a musical style and that because it's a personal preference. Amen? Now, here's, here's what's going to happen. If we are going to move closer to this common life that Jesus is talking about, what's going to have to happen is we're going to have to start saying to ourselves, individually, say to ourselves, my preferences don't matter. Now, I'm not going to tell you that your preferences don't matter. I have to depend on you to tell yourself that. Because if I tell you your preferences don't matter, that's just me. (laughs) And honestly, your preferences do matter to me. That's a part of who you are. I care about that. But as a humble servant of Jesus, if you are not telling yourself, my preferences don't matter, this life Jesus wants for us is completely out of reach. It's out of reach. Because as soon as one musical style is picked for one song, we just split. You maybe didn't leave the room, but you, you checked out of worship, right? Or on, on who speaks and how long and, and what their style is. You know, Don's going to come speak. He has a different style than I do. Some people are going to prefer that and wish for that, and other people, whatever. And if, if we keep sticking to our preferences and what makes us different, do you realize we can never be who Jesus wants as a community? It's always going to be out of reach. We'll have something good, but never the best. Are you with me? Like, I thought, because I love you, and I love Christ Church, and I love Him. And I just, for so long, I've wanted him to have what he wants. And so a big part of my job as a pastor and just as a disciple, I look around and say, Jesus, what's keeping us from that? 
Again, it's not that what we have is bad and terrible. It's just, it's not all that he wants. And so I just ask, I pray, I observe, I pray. I say, what is keeping us from that in real life? And this is one of the ones that just pops up so clearly. Ryan, you guys, you don't even know what you have in common. You just don't know. Me too, Lord. Yeah, you too, Ryan. (laughs) You don't know. But I'm looking at it. I know the words. Yeah, you know the words. Jesus says to me, you know the words. But words are supposed to transfer meaning, right? So I've I've been uh, studying myself. I've been observing what's in me that keeps me from doing. Because I'll admit to you, if everyone were just like me, I'm not sure we would be there. Because I have my own weirdness about things. And Jesus is calling me like everyone else to, to repent. Look at what is true, Ryan. Okay, Lord. So I tell you what, let's just use this as an example. On Wednesday, somebody comes in with an old hymn. Okay, old hymn. And I know a lot of them, but there's a lot I don't know. And somebody says, I, I want to share this together. And everybody in the room is like, what is that hymn? We don't know that hymn. Oh, okay, never mind then. That's, that's the old way. The spirit way says, we don't know that. Will you teach us? We want to have that song in common with you because it's about Jesus. Another person comes in. It's like a brand new song playing on the radio about Jesus and half the people haven't heard it. They're like, oh, never mind then. Rather, shouldn't the body of Christ say to each other, we want to have that in common with you. We, how does that go? Now, of course, the person may not want to sing in front of everybody. That's okay. But at least read the words. Let's, let's share those words together. Yeah. And as you and I, over and over again, it's going to take discipline. It's going to take messing up and learning and getting it right. But every time we have the choice between, oh, that's different, never mind, or oh, that's different, let's bring it into the commonality. Let's share it. That's the choice we have to make. Now, I can't make that happen. You can't make it happen by yourself. If together we keep making that choice, you know what's going to happen? By the Holy Spirit's grace and power, we're going to start living this life without even realizing it started. We're just going to look around one day and go, oh, look at that. We've got it. So let me, I'm ending differently than I meant like, meant to. Let me, let me just challenge you with this. This week as you're thinking, hopefully, on the Word of God, on what it means that fellowship together, all that we share, which that was a partial list. Think to yourself, what are the differences between my brothers and sisters and me that really mean the most to me? What are the preference things that really mean a lot to me? Now, one of the steps you're going to have to take is actually to to be wise enough to know the difference between your preference and God's preference. (laughs) I've done it, so I'll just talk about myself. There have been times I've realized that I thought because I liked it, that must be how God likes it. Have you ever been there? Oh, I think that way. Obviously, God must too. Oh, wow. Then you, you, hum, you get humbled by the Lord. You learn some more about Him. And you realize, oh, it's very possible He thinks differently than I do sometimes. And, and if you're wise enough to make a distinction between my preference and God's desire... Once you get there, you can start saying to yourself, so which of my preferences do I need to just get over? Just, again, not instantly, but just work on getting over that. When that pops into my mind, I just tell myself, oh, yeah, but my preferences don't matter. Which are yours? Might be music. And so I may be upset you today, (laughs) and it wasn't my intention. But it might be all kinds of things. You just have to figure this out within your own self as a disciple. And, And tell yourself, train under Jesus to tell yourself, but what does God desire? What does my master Jesus want? What's good for his people? And lo and behold, wouldn't you know it, the more that you train to put aside your own stuff and focus on God and his people, do you realize what you're actually learning is love? And brothers and sisters, what is the law stated two ways of God's kingdom? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Wouldn't you know it? Surprise, surprise. The key to fellowship is love. Figuring out how to love. No matter what. No matter who. 
love. So I'll put aside myself, I'll put aside my preferences, I'll put aside the way I'd rather it, and I'll focus on what does my master Jesus want? What is good for his people? And as each of us does that, oh my, we just might experience the kind of church life that seemed like a fairy tale in the book of Acts, lived out by real people today. And if anyone should be able to experience this, it's we who above anything else in our lives are disciples of Jesus Christ.